A good time zone, everyone. This week, we're going to be revisiting the topic of the Dulacher. Now, in case you haven't seen my first video on this topic, the story of the Dulacher is actually about a prison guard who faked his own disappearance, disguised himself as a huge black pig, began assaulting women and spreading the story that it was actually being done by the ghost of an inmate who had committed suicide before he could be executed and had somehow returned in the form of a huge black pig to take revenge. Now, this is going to be a comparatively short video because there's not very much information on this story. I've traced it back as far as I can to an issue of the Dublin Penny Journal from 1832. And most other sources either directly reference this issue of the Dublin Penny Journal or in fact just copy out the story contained in it word for word. The Dublin Penny Journal describes this story as if it were a matter of historical fact, and that is how it is often discussed even today. Now I need to clarify at this point that I am not a historian, I am a folklorist, and so my input on this matter is of limited value. However, the story itself has no dates. It only names Olacher, no other individual in the story is named. It says these events were all over the newspapers and caused mass hysteria, yet I have found no mention of it in the Irish newspaper archive or in histories of Black Dog Prison, where the story was supposed to have taken place. Now, ordinarily, that would be fine. Things don't have to be a matter of historical fact to be folklore. In fact, that things that are folklore often aren't historical fact. So it's just a piece of folklore. That's also not entirely clear whether it is a piece of folklore or not. The vast majority of sources that talk about the Dolacher story refer back to the Dublin Penny Journal. None of them say, my granny once told me the story of the Dolacher, or I heard this story from an old man down the pub, that kind of thing. And one source lists it as being well known to students of old Dublin, which suggests it was something that was really only known to academics and amateur academics. Now, this all suggests that it was quite firmly a part of the literary tradition and not really a part of the oral tradition, which would qualify it as folklore. Now you'd think if this was a story mostly known to historians and other academics and it was apocryphal that they would have said something about it, but the thing is the real Black Dog prison was very well known for the corruption of its staff. They would do things like forcing prisoners to rent beds, and if they couldn't pay for them, they would have to sleep on the floor. The area around Dublin where Black Dog prison was located was well known for street gangs and violence. And that violence was often goaded on by the staff of Black Dog Prison. Uh, this is editing hog. Um, I've just noticed I've I've forgotten something. There's there's a part of this story, uh, a feature of the story, a motif, a metaphor, a piece of imagery that I I missed, and that I. I don't know how I missed it, I don't know how, I didn't see it when I was writing the script and how I didn't notice it was missing when I was filming, but it's absolutely, it's ridiculous. I, I can't, I can't believe I'm, I can't believe I missed it. I cannot 
believe How did it come to this? Lost, spiraling in the ether, faced with my own failure. All my thoughts of who and what I am lost to time. If I am capable of such blindness, can I ever truly be said to see at all? <laughs> all that is left is void. I scripted out the entire Dulliker video. I, I, I researched everything about historical context, d d d traced the line of how it entered into the oral tradition from the livery tradition, traced its origins in the livery tradition. I found out it was about, it was about, <laughs> it was about police corruption. Right? It's, it's obviously, it's clearly about police corruption. And then with the historical context, that even comes even more obvious. But I had scripted the entire video, done all that research. I had filmed the video. <laughs> and not noticed that it's a story about a prison guard who disguises himself as a pig in order to commit Crimes! I am a fraud! A failure! The most heavy-handed piece of imagery I have ever seen in my life! And I'm looking at historical context! Okay, but, uh, there's no water in this shower. And while the story isn't very precise when it comes to things like dates and names, it does show a pretty strong knowledge of the geography of Dublin. So while I don't think this is a historical account, I do think that it's very representative of the kind of things that were happening in Dublin at the time. It's plausible given its historical context. And because the story wouldn't really be of that much historical significance, I don't think many people have seen any need to push into it very far. In my opinion, this story was a work of fiction composed to highlight some of the social issues, prison corruption and street violence of Dublin within that time period. And the fact that it is often believed as factual just shows its prescience. Now, I wanted to confirm my suspicion that this was a story primarily of the literary tradition and not really one of the oral tradition, which would qualify it as a folktale. So I went looking for the Dalakar on Dukas.ie through the schools collection. I found nothing. So I had to look at some of the very few manuscripts from Dublin that have been digitized so far on Dukas and again I found nothing. So I scheduled an appointment with the National Folklore Archive to go read through the Urban Folklore Project because if it was anywhere it was going to be there. Now the wonderful people at the Irish Folklore Archive 
when you have a research appointment booked, they will ask you what you're researching so that they can have any of the texts they can find available for you and ready for you to read when you get there. They found absolutely nothing. Which was the result I was expecting, honestly, and I ended up not going because there was no point. The thing is, the Urban Folklore Project was compiled between the years 1979 and 1980. And I have heard the Dolliker story myself being told. In fact, I've primarily heard it rather than read it. Except after I started researching this, obviously. So, I do think it has made the jump into the oral tradition but I think that must have happened somewhere between 1980 and the early 2010s when I first encountered the story. Texts that mention the Dalakar are few and far between. Most of them are out of print and only really accessible through things like JSTOR and in some cases aren't accessible at all unless you know someone who happens to own a physical copy already. But the story was still spreading through things like the Gravedigger bus tour and the Story Map Dublin project. Uh, the video of the story used in the Story Map project was recorded in 2012, and the storyteller was a man named Brendan Nolan. Brendan Nolan was also the author of Dublin Folk Tales, which was also published in 2012 and does contain the Dolliker story. Brendan was a member of Dublin Yarn Spinners, a, a storytelling club based in Dublin. He would often tell stories that would later be contained in his book before it was released. Brendan was very fond of reading old books about Dublin, learning about old Dublin characters, and in most of the stories he told were about Dublin. Now I know this last chunk of information because I was also a member of Dublin Yarn Spinners in 2012. If I'm correct in saying that this is when and how the Dolliker story made the leap from literary tradition to oral tradition, then that would mean I was there. I was there, young dog. I was there 3,000 years ago. When that happened. But, even more than that, considering that I have been talking to friends and co-workers about this story and including references to it in my own work ever since I first heard it from Brendan, not only was I there when it happened, but I also directly participated in the story making that leap from literary tradition to oral tradition. I'd like to use this to illustrate a point. All of us are constantly having moments like that, that we're not even aware of. We're all constantly present for, witnessing the development of new pieces of folklore, of witnessing the leap of things from the literary tradition to the oral tradition, we're witnessing the change of the oral tradition all the time and all of us have moments where we are seeing that happen for the first first time we just don't know it and not all of us are researchers not all of us are people who go back and look at these things and therefore have an opportunity to sometimes see catch glimpses of when they have had those moments in the past but we do all have them. This means, uh, this means that we all have a direct and important influence on how our cultures develop, which is mind blowing to think about, but it's also very humbling. It's an awful lot of responsibility. It's a responsibility that every single person alive has to each other and to ourselves. Folklore helps influence culture, helps influence
and social attitudes helps influence political climates. Nobody is unimportant and nothing is ever just a story. Actually, I'm not done. I thought I was done, but I'm not done. There's another thing. The Dolliker is often referred to as the Irish version of Jack the Ripper, and that makes absolutely no sense. First of all, Jack the Ripper was real. The Dolliker probably wasn't. Second of all, Jack the Ripper killed a load of people. In the story, the Dolliker killed no one. Oliker, the man who was supposed to be executed, killed one person, but the prison guard who was running around in the pig skin that was the Dolliker killed no one. Third of all, it feeds into this whole thing that happens so frequently of Irish things, pieces of folklore or mythology or even our archaeology being referred to as the Irish version of something more famous from a more, and heavy air quotes on this, a more legitimate culture. Like, Newgrange gets referred to as the Irish Stonehenge. Her uh, Cúchulain is the Irish Hercules. The Paiste is the Irish version of a dragon. I've even heard the Mordish referred to as the Irish version of Medusa. And it speaks to such insecurity in Irish culture regarding our own things. We have to legitimize them by associating them with something else. It annoys the fuck out of me. We did not need your fanfic making Avertok into a vampire so that Ireland could have an Irish version of Dracula. There's already an Irish version of Dracula. The Irish version of Dracula is fucking Dracula.